This is a capital budgeting essay. The company is Focused Solution. And since this is capital budgeting, this is from part two, section E. And we'll see here we got a number of requirements, but we don't really have any, any math or numbers that we're going to work with. And so this is an essay much more than it is a problem. But we'll go ahead and get right started with our information. Focus Solution Inc. is a management consulting company. As part of its annual planning process, the company is reviewing proposed capital projects. Staff generated investment project proposals consistent with the company's strategic objectives, and the executive team has narrowed the proposals down to two proposed projects as described below. Proposal 1. The first project relates to opening a new office in either New York or Chicago. The company had purchased a building in Chicago several years ago for this purpose and have already partially rehabilitated the building. The company is also working with the client with some projects in New York that they may not be able to take if they do not build the New York office. So if we don't have the New York office, there may be some projects in New York that we're going to lose. Proposal 2. The other project includes a technology upgrade of the latest mini tablet computers for all consultants and an expansion of the headquarters in San Francisco. So a new office in either New York or Chicago. We already have the building in Chicago. If we don't accept or if we don't put a new office in New York, we may lose some business. Or we can give everybody new computers and expand the headquarters in San Francisco. The president selected proposal two as he believes that the consultants need to project a professional image and could continue to travel to both New York and Chicago. The CFO requested that additional criteria be reviewed before the project selection was finalized. The CFO noted that there were several projects undertaken in the past that did not generate the expected cash flows or the anticipated return on investment. He also wanted to ensure that the selected projects met the company's hurdle rate. The president agreed to post audits on the projects from the prior year and additional capital budgeting analysis on each of the proposed projects. So the president chose proposal two. The CFO said, well, let's kind of look at some other things here because in the past we haven't always gotten what it is that we were expecting to get out of a project. And so we're kind of looking at kind of a second, second pair of eyes going through this, I guess, is what we could say that the CFO is trying to do. So our requirements, one, identify and describe three steps in the capital budgeting process. Two, identify and explain the role of the post audit in the capital budgeting process. Number three, define hurdle rate, sunk cost, and opportunity cost. Explain how each is relevant to capital budgeting. Four, should the company use cash flows or accounting profits in its capital budgeting analysis and explain. Number five, should the company consider total amounts or incremental amounts in its capital budgeting process? Explain. Number six, describe how the company should be considering the impact of income taxes and inflation on their cash flows. And seven, explain the decision criteria used to determine acceptable projects when using net present value and internal rate of return, respectively. <clears throat> so we have seven requirements that we have to go through here. And as we see, there's no numbers. There's no calculations. We don't have to calculate the net present value. We don't have to calculate the internal rate of return. We're just kind of going through some things about capital budgeting. So moving along to the first requirement, identify and describe three steps in the capital budgeting process. Now, I'll be honest with you, this is kind of a weird requirement because it isn't that there's three steps, but we only need to identify and describe three steps in the capital budgeting process. And so what you choose, what are your three steps? There's you know, things to choose from. So this says the remaining steps in capital budgeting process that the executives should undertake include Okay, now the way they set up their answer here is kind of saying, well, we're going to keep doing some stuff that hasn't been done yet. Okay, so that's how they set it up. You can do that or you can just say three steps in the capital budgeting process are estimating the after-tax incremental operating cash flows for investment projects, evaluating project incremental cash flows, selecting projects based on a value maximizing acceptance criterion, securing project financing either internally or externally, and evaluating implemented investment projects continually and performing post audits for completed projects. Now, if we look at how they've set this up, we can kind of make this into a nice three 
steps in the capital budgeting process. We can make it the first step here, which includes the first two bullet points, so, uh, getting the information, gathering the information about whatever projects would it, it is that we are considering. The second step would be then to make a decision and implement it. So the next two bullets there, choose our option, figure out how we're going to finance it. And then the third step is the post audit, evaluating it after it's been implemented, making certain that it's taking place. And so we could have set this up here as kind of a one, two, three this way. That would have been fine as well. But just we want to have three steps to the capital budgeting process. Um, they presented it in more of a bullet format. We could, as I said, kind of consolidated that into collecting the information, making a decision, and then following up on it to make certain that what we thought was going to happen actually happened. As we know from the problem, that doesn't, isn't always the case for the company. So that's the first requirement. The second requirement is identify and explain the role of the post-audit in the capital budgeting process. Well, in the information of the question, they kind of give us a little bit of guidance about this because they talked about how the CFO said, we don't always get what it is that we expect out of the investment project. So a post-completion audit is a formal comparison of the actual costs and benefits of a project with original estimates. A key element of the audit is feedback, meaning that results of the audit are given to relevant personnel so that future decision-making can be improved. Yeah, and this is kind of what the CFO was hinting at. We haven't always gotten what we thought we were going to get in the past, so you know, let's make certain we're looking critically at what it is that we're making in these estimates now for these decisions. Post-completion audits allow management to determine how close the actual results of an implemented project have come to its original estimate. When used properly, key phrase there, progress reviews and post-completion audits can help identify forecasting weakness and any important factors that were omitted, things that we just didn't take into account. With a good feedback system, any lesson learned can be used to improve the quality of future capital budgeting decision making. Okay, taking this into the future and improving it. Post audit also exerts discipline in the investment planning and control process. If managers are aware that post completion audits are to be undertaken, they may take more care when developing initial assumptions and estimates and when making investment decisions. They may also take more care when managing an investment project through to completion. So a very complete answer here, probably a little bit more complete than it would need to be, but very good here in talking about getting this post audit and then using what we learn from that in other future capital budgeting decisions and also the role that this may have on helping people be a little more accurate and perhaps a little more conscientious when they're doing this if they know that this post audit is going to take place. So the third requirement, define hurdle rate, sunk cost, and opportunity cost. Explain how each is relevant to capital budgeting. So three items here. The hurdle rate is the minimum required rate of return on an investment in a discounted cash flow analysis. This is the rate at which a project is acceptable. Okay. What it is, how it works. Sunk costs are unrecoverable past outlays that, because they cannot be recovered, should not affect present actions or future decisions. And then here's an example. The building cost in Chicago is a sunk cost. Okay. Good, good point here. Take it out of the question. Show that you've read the question. You understand how this is kind of connected to that. And third, opportunity costs are what is lost by not taking the next best investment opportunity, uh, next best investment alternative. The loss of the New York work could be an opportunity cost of going with a different option. Remember, if we don't have the office in New York, we might lose some clients in New York. And so the opportunity cost of opening the office in Chicago is this lost business in New York. The opportunity cost of expanding the office in San Francisco is this lost business in New York. And so this is going to be part of that decision-making process. Okay, the fourth requirement, should the company use cash flows or accounting profits in its capital budgeting analysis? and explain. Okay, the short answer is cash flows. Okay, everything we're doing with capital budgeting has to do with cash flows. So cash, not accounting income, is central to all decisions of the firm. Benefits expected from a project should be expressed in terms of cash flows rather than income flows. The firm invests cash now, what they're doing, in hope of receiving even greater cash returns in the future. 
only cash can be reinvested in the firm or paid to shareholders in the form of dividends. Okay? So cash flows, not accounting profits, because we're trying to increase the cash for the company because that's what's able to be reinvested. That's what's able to be distributed to the owners. Okay? So that was the fourth, the fifth requirement. Should the company consider total amounts or incremental amounts in its capital budgeting process and explain? Well, incremental costs should be used so that only the differences between the cash flows of the firm with and without the project are analyzed. This is one of those big issues about relevant and irrelevant is we need to know what's different between the two, two options, three options, however many options there are. And so what we're looking at here is using are the incremental, the incremental amounts. Um, for example, if a firm contemplates a new project that is likely to compete with existing projects, it is not appropriate to express cash flows in terms of estimate total sales of the new project. If cash flows will erode, if they do not invest, they must factor this into their analysis. The key is to analyze the situation with and without the new investment and make sure all relevant costs and benefits are brought into play. Only incremental cash flows matter. How is it going to be different if we invest than if we don't invest in this project? How is it going to be different? That is what it is that we're measuring. And so incremental costs, incremental cash flows is what it is that we're using when we're making these decisions. Okay, the sixth requirement, describe how the company should be considering the impact of income taxes and inflation on their cash flow. So we have two paragraphs here, two short paragraphs, one having to do with income taxes and one having to do with inflation. The initial investment outlay as well as the appropriate discount rate will be expressed in after-tax terms. Thus, all forecast flows need to be stated on an equivalent after-tax basis. Okay, we could have written this at the beginning by simply saying all cash flows need to be after tax. Okay, if there's a tax implication for any of the cash flows, all cash flows need to be presented after tax. Now, there's kind of giving an example here. The method of depreciation is an important consideration of the impact of income taxes because depreciation lowers taxable income. Everything else being equal, the greater the depreciation charges, the lower the tax is paid. Although depreciation itself is a non-cash expense, it does affect the firm's cash flow by directly influencing the cash outflow of taxes paid. Now, this is what they have in their answer. I would probably couch this to say an example of tax flow or the impact of taxes would be on depreciation, but it's also simply a matter of recognizing that all the cash flows that we have need to be after-tax cash flows when we're taking in, when we're doing this. And so the impact of income taxes should be taken into account in everything. Okay, on the cash flows, our discount rates, everything needs to be done after tax. So that's the tax part in terms of inflation. Anticipated inflation must also be considered. Often there is a tendency to assume erroneously, mistakenly, that price levels will remain unchanged throughout the life of a project. If the required rate of return for a project to be accepted embodies a premium for inflation, as it usually does, then the estimate cash flows must also reflect inflation. Such cash flows are affected in several ways. If cash inflows ultimately arise from the sale of a product, expected future prices affect those inflows. As for cash outflows, inflation affects both expected future wages and material costs. Another way of saying this would be that if the company adjusts its interest rates for inflation, it also has to adjust its cash flows for inflation. So you say you either have to adjust both or neither. If you don't have an inflation adjusted discount rate, then you don't have to inflation adjust your cash flows, but you can't have inflation adjusted cash flows, but not an inflation adjusted discount rate or vice versa. With our cash flows and our discount rates, we either have to inflation adjust both of them or neither of them. And that's what they're saying here is that most times the, the premium has an adjust, the, the discount rate, the required rate of return includes inflation. And so therefore we also need to include inflation in our cash flows as well. And this takes us to our last requirement. Explain the decision criteria used to determine acceptable projects. 
when using net present value and internal rate of return respectively. Okay, just how are we making these decisions? When NPV is used to determine acceptable project, the company must estimate a hurdle rate. Often the weighted average cost of capital, this hurdle rate may be adjusted based on the riskiness of the proposed project. Each year's cash flow of the proposed project is estimated and then discounted back to the present period using that hurdle rate, that discount rate. Net present value is calculated by adding the discounted future cash flows together and subtracting the initial cash outlay at the time of investment. If the net present value is positive, the decision rule says go ahead. If the net present value is negative, the decision rule says don't go ahead. Okay, you could, don't have to say go ahead. You could say we invest in projects that have a, net a positive net present value. We don't consider projects that have a negative net present value. Okay, but that's how we're using it. We explain what it is, and then we say how it is that we're using it. So that's net present value, internal rate of return. Using the internal rate of return decision rule starts the same way. Find a hurdle rate and estimate the cash flows of the project. Instead of discounting future cash flows using the hurdle rate, an internal rate of return is calculated for the proposed project. This internal rate of return is the, at the rate at which the discounted future cash flows equal the undiscounted initial investment. The internal rate of return is compared to the hurdle rate. If the internal rate of return is greater than the hurdle rate, we go ahead. If the internal rate of return is less than the hurdle rate, we don't go ahead. Okay, so again, explaining what it is, it's the interest rate at which the net present value of the project is equal to zero, and how it is that we use that internal rate of return to make a decision. In nearly all real life examples, the net present value decision rule leads to the same go, no go answer as the internal rate, of internal rate of return decision rule. In the rare case when the two decision rules lead to different decisions, the analyst should examine if the cash flow pattern shifted more than once. If so, the analyst can explain why the internal rate of return rule is not appropriate. We also could have said here that generally we're going to try to maximize our net present value. And so if the internal rate of return and net present value give different decision results. We're most likely going to choose the project that has the higher net present value because that's generally what's going to lead us to maximizing our shareholder wealth, which is ultimately what we're trying to do with this decision that we're making. So again, a capital, uh, kind of wrapping this up, a capital budgeting question without any numbers, the theory of it, different elements of it, net present value, internal rate of return, um, some different types of costs, what we do with inflation, what we do with income taxes. But again, it's just a matter of going through step by step, answering the question, make certain we answer each of these questions. We're not writing books about any of these. We're just, you know, we're explaining it, we're identifying it, we're defining it, and we're not writing paragraphs and paragraphs about these things. We need to make certain that we get answers to each of these requirements because each of these requirements have points associated with them and we're going to need points from each of the requirements to get all the points for this question, which is what we're going to do, and this is going to be part of our passing score on the exam as a whole.